Okay, finally getting around to editing the last and final episode of the Home Brew Computer Club Reunion. It's been a while since I've been able to get the, the new commercial version of the video editor, and now I've got it, and now I'm finally putting together the final episode of the Home Brew Computer Club. So, enjoy. Uh I remember then one of the things, the first thing they were teaching these grade school students was to change the name of one of the characters or put their name somewhere in the sign on uh, and then have, see that displayed um, up in the, their, their display, et, et cetera. And, you know, they, they became part of it. Um, I had done a little bit earlier than that um, a... Uh, I'd gotten myself on some of the very earliest Sony uh, portable uh, video recorders. And I strapped all those to, my, to a backpack uh, with a, uh, a, a motorcycle battery <laughs> to power the whole thing and went off to, to take pictures of the whole world. And I had a little... I'd say seven inch um, CRT. Um, it was uh, it was GE product, and so I could put that around, and it would run off at of twelve volts also. So I put that in, and people were just absolutely stargazed. They had never felt that they would see their name on television. You know, never see them on television, much less the name or anything like this. And they were just you know, like that I could see my picture being displayed on a television set just was the ultimate thing. Oh, I didn't never, never think that I would be in a place where I could, would be, be on a television. Um, these, cool things are, these cool things are what drove us back in the homebrew days. Yeah. Steve, do you yeah, remember those old cartridges you used to yeah. get? You, you got a you got a sale. You bought a whole bunch of those cartridges, and that was where you got mm -hmm. involved in recording TV programs, and that oh, eventually yeah. led up to getting satellite TV and stuff. Remember that? And of course, the well, it uh, cost a school a thousand dollars to buy a black and white VCR back then, oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. Art Division had gone out of business so quickly, and their duplication center for movies was in San Jose, and they were selling completely brand new machines never touched didn't even have a case on them for sixty dollars each cart division wow, wow. recorders and they even had a timer built in you could sell it recorded mm -hmm. at a certain time and uh just just way ahead of its time it, kind of a, a weird technology inside a big huge spinning wheel that was the um it was the helical head with the electronics on it but that was cool and even <laughs> cameras they were selling cameras for a cheap price like 25 bucks and somehow I used that machine. I actually had it so early before, you know, there was Betamax, before there was VHS. And I actually managed mm -hmm. to record Nixon's resignation on Cartrovision. Mm -hmm. That goes, not too many people could do that back then, unless you work <laughs> in a TV company. Andy, that uh, yep. uh, camera, uh, that, that Sony, that was black and white, right? Real to real? Yeah, it was black and white. Yeah, okay. I, I played with that. Uh, and it had it. It had a camera that plugged right into it. Also a Sony black and white. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I very clever to. I don't want to talk about what we did for battery. It was a backpack with a whole. It was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you More remember at that time when you looked through the video uh, viewer? Uh, yeah. And if you your battery finally went dead, what would happen? was the whole picture would collapse into a very bright sun right in the center and then the whole thing explode <laughs> more than once yeah uh, yeah okay. yeah what happened what happened you know yeah because because there was no no battery indicator that was that was of any reality anyway sorry we well, get drifted San, away san francisco dance company came out east and i convinced them that that i should with this porta pack, I could actually. They were doing a a circle dance, the with all the dancers in a in a big circle like this, and the, the, I put myself into one of the members of the circle, and got a, a 
picture or display of this. And it was it was fascinating because if you looked at, it, especially in slow mo, uh, you would get you would see these dancers who were really uh, very uh, uh, very dramatic. I mean, they were they were spinning fast and so on like this. And if you looked at it, the human body would start taking shapes that were unnatural <laughs> because of the centrifugal force. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that was and the, the camera delay, yeah. And that was yeah, that was the lead in to something disappearing. And I went like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, yeah. Oh, anyways, I, now I, we all have high definition TV cameras in our pockets. So right, yeah. <laughs> I, I date the computer revolution from the uh, TV typewriter article, September seventy three, Radio Electronics, mm -hmm. and that one, it was just a in effect the terminal and you would, the, the cover showed a, a tv screen and it's a, there's a pair of hands coming in from the bottom there's a little keyboard there and it said uh, use the tv type build the tv typewriter and put messages up on your your, your tv screen mm -hmm. and they uh the, the construction plans for that were too extensive for them to print so they said well we'll do what we've done before send in two dollars and uh a self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll send you the plans now a big response for radio electronics and that was a magazine that was aimed at radio and tv repair technicians um big response was five or it was like 20 paid envelopes and they got ten thousand responses and very clearly something was happening uh mm -hmm. and then of course it we eventually i was at that time trying to find out alternatives to teletypes for terminals for community memory. And I, I looked at it and, and, and burrowed into it a little bit and found out that it only did page display. So that if you were filling up a page with text and you got to the bottom and you got past the last character, it would flip to the next page, which is blank. Now that doesn't work very well as a terminal. So I called up Don Lancaster in Arizona and I asked him, why did you do it that way? And he said, well, I don't know. People just want to see their, you know, see words on TV screens. That's, you know, I didn't really think about doing it as a terminal, even though the article said it could be used, be used as, a, as a terminal. Mm -hmm. And then he said some other guy had gotten, you know, I've sent an article into, I guess, Radio Electronics that was using random access memory chips with, uh, instead of the shift register chips he used. Uh, and he was going to do one like that and so forth. We went back and forth a little. And that's yeah. the idea in my mind that, okay, the random access, the static random access chips are just coming out at that point. And um, you could, uh, you know, you, you need to store an image in order to present it on the TV screen. So why not use those? And, if, and that worked eventually through and I realized, okay, but they could be part of the computer's memory. Uh, so that's what I did for the uh, the specification I wrote up in 1974, the Tom Swift terminal. The idea of something you could build that starts as a terminal because, yes, uh, the 8080 was like $400 or $375 at that time. And so that was, I put it out of reach. But you could have a terminal if you had a memory board and an input board and an output board. So I did a design of uh, and a specification, engineering specification for a terminal that would grow up and eventually could accept a microprocessor. It never got built, but then again, they're kind of all like that. Yeah, I was always yeah. poor, and sometimes that helped me in my designs. And when I went out to build an ARPANET terminal <clears throat> from my work at Hewlett Packard, I knew that dynamic shifting memories were the lowest cost per bit you'd find. And uh, so I just used the cheapest little chips I could get that had enough memory for it for you know the, the screen display. And um, and I wanted things to be digital. Digital counter counts up and it knows exactly when it's the right time to go back. I was an analog TV engineer as well. You know, I, mm -hmm. I had good experience in even color TV and all that. And um, I just didn't like how you design it with the op amps and the feedback loops and you test it and you try to get it right and make changes. And it's all analog. That was flakier to me than digital. Digital, I learned, was really accurate from the blue box. You want a certain tone? You divide a crystal, a megahertz crystal, say, by the right number, and you get an exact tone. 
and just the reliability of it. And so that was the only way I went, but I didn't know there was a TV terminal that was analog. And when I did go back and look at it, in the end with analog devices and the differential calculus design circuits, you know, with the feedback loops, Don Lancaster had done a very uh, cheap job. I didn't realize that he just ran out after one one screen, had to go to another one. Um, yeah. but, but anyway, but the, the thing is, those are the sort of things that intrigued us all to keep moving in this direction that something was coming and it was digital and it was computers and and uh, the uh, world is going to be surprised. And uh, I will I, I will remind you, those of you who were at Homebrew, that I was one of the semiconductor engineers at that time. Uh, <laughs> AMRK. <laughs> Or yeah, you, you I was sold me my first 4K dynamics. I sold you. I gave them to you. <laughs> I gave you a shoebox. Well, I think you sold them for about five bucks each. No, I never sold anything. I gave well, everything away. Uh, I gave away uh, the um, uh, the Pong chips. Remember the Pong chips? Uh, was I wasn't me. interested, I don't think. I didn't get one. Later. Uh, but Maybe everybody else was. I oh, think well. 150 of them disappeared in an afternoon. Uh, but uh, no, I gave you a shoebox full of 6,800 parts. As, uh, AMI was the second source, and I was the engineer. Mm. Well, it There's was the, whole... the Atari the Atari Pawn chips were the reason they didn't have time to accept our offer to buy the Apple II. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to make so much money off of the home first home Pawn game. Uh, they did. Uh, that was taking they up made, their whole mind. A, you have no idea how much. I know how many chips we processed at AMI. So yes, they did. They made, we wouldn't even look at a project if it wasn't half a million die. And this one was like two and a half million. And yeah, we did. A, we love that chip. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was, uh, that was a great time, you know, being on the inside of the semiconductor industry and watching all this computer stuff start and, uh, being able to uh, trade things of value for other things of value. I think that was my favorite time at the mm -hmm. homebrew. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I went home with a teletype one time. Don't ask me what I traded for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, the uh, industry, the, the Silicon Valley uh, specifically, um, everybody thinks that, uh, you know, there's this big Mount Olympus in the center and all the important people sat around a table at top. And of course, since I was there at that time, clearly you must've been in the, you know, part of that group. And of course I wasn't. Um, I was down in the bay, in the valley with everybody else because there really wasn't one big center. It was a bunch of little molehills, all the companies. And between them were the, the third places, the bar, bars and grills where everybody went for lunch, and went afterwards for drinks and where you could, after you had been locked out of your company, uh, find, meet your coworkers, recruit them to your new company or, and, or find out how they're making things work. And so that those, those barns, bars and grills uh, were the connective tissue for the networking that was going on. That's what made it work. Let's talk a little bit about the computer fair and some of the stuff that you did, Steve, at the computer fair. Uh, uh, I was at the work furlough program at the time, and they actually allowed me to go to the computer fair and demonstrate my Easy Writer One, and it was right next door to the Fourth Interest Group booth. And uh, we were on the, we were at the Apple Pie booth right next door. So when anybody wanted to know what language we wrote, we, it was written in, we just point to the fourth guys, and the fourth people would uh, people say, "Well, what language? What what?" products have been written and then they, they point to easy writer it was like a, a symbiotic relationship made in heaven and i can remember steve you coming up to me one time in our booth and you say you got to go to the apple booth right away and uh, why don't you tell a story about what happened at the apple booth with uh, dave gordon and the pie do you remember that i don't remember that one specifically i do remember our discussions about you know feeling our apple II was so great and uh, we wanted to get the prime viewing spot at the fair and I wrote a program to show off at that fair. This is back at a different time. Political correctness was different, but it asked you your name. And if it could determine what your nationality was, it went ahead with that nationality or it said, what nationality are you? And you could type it in, I'm Greek. And then it would go through a whole bunch of um, 
like Polish jokes, but it would change them to whatever your nationality was, because that's what people <laughs> always wanted. And that was how we demonstrated the Apple II that day. That was one of the well, things. Yeah, as I remember correctly, what happened was, uh, was Dave Gordon, which was at the uh, Los Angeles uh, Computer, uh, Computer uh, Club, had copied the new Apple II ROM. And the new Apple II ROM had been copied, and they made a ROM out of it, and they were showing it off at the at the West Coast Computer Fair. Of course, it was copyrighted stuff from Apple, and so what happened was uh, Randy Wigginton uh, was at the Apple booth at the time, and he had a apple pie behind his back. And when Dave Gordon come up to the Apple booth, Randy Wigginton just had a, a beautiful, beautiful right-handed swish right into his face. It was an apple cream pie. If I may remember, I, I got to go pretty soon. So real quickly, it was Chris Espinosa. I know because I have a picture of the event. I was pre-warned. Oh, this was about Chris it. Espinosa. Okay, sorry, my bad. Okay. That's all right. Just want to say hi to everybody. Lee, Diane says hi. Steve, good to see you. I've been kind of going in and out of the industry for about 45 years. This month marks serial number 138 Apple II purchase in Los Angeles. Started one of the first <laughs> software companies. Bob Bishop, who went on to work later on with, uh, he, he was doing games for us at Soft Tape, using machine language uh, coding, along with Gary Shannon and a whole bunch of other early guys. I knew uh, John from the Easy Rider days. I was hanging around Information Unlimited Software with Eagle Beak and Steve Baker and that whole bunch of gang. Worked at Computer Land. Uh, stories go on and on and on. I'd take longer to tell them than Steve probably would. Joe Alinsky. <laughs> Sorry? Do you remember Joe Alinsky then? We were on that group. Yeah, I do. Sure do. Down south. Uh, um, I have I have um, 40 days and nights away from my family and my dogs coming up, and I have to leave on a flight very soon. So I've got to duck out now. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much, Steve, for uh, uh, showing up at the uh, Homebrew Computer Club. This has been a rather enlightening uh, reunion. And so I'm going to give each and, each and every one of you a link to the uh to a a um a um um a uh i think it's a dropbox or something yeah. and uh so you'll get a copy of this and then i want to do is edit this uh put a nice little promo onto it and i also want to put the demonstration for easy writer one in there too somewhere uh and kind of you know split things up and and make it into a nice into a nice production and then pl i plan to do is put it up on the uh up on vimeo and put it up there for a couple of weeks first of all and uh that make it available to, my, to the patreons of course and then afterwards uh eventually put it up on youtube john you have hands raised by so Andrew. that's that'll yeah. be how it's going to be kind of kind of be produced that way yeah you have hands raised by andrew and jeff here yeah go and ahead well, I, I'll I'll be real quick because I want Steve to be able to go and be with his family and, and have a good trip. Uh, I had a question for you, but I'll I'll maybe wait until there's a next time. Um, but thanks for spending your valuable time with us, uh, well, everybody here, um, but but Waz especially and and Lee. It was great to hear from you. Great yeah, and Jeff, do you have anything you want to say too? Uh, Waz, it it was great to see you live here. Uh, Red and seen so much and everything. Big fan. I, I won't. I want to want you to have a safe flight. Um, I wanted to also send a hi from uh, a Laurie and Corey Cole of uh, Quest for Glory game fame. I don't know if there's any fan here, but they say hello. Corey once dropped in the homebrew club, so if uh, if any of you all played, they would like to they would like to know too. So, uh, but but have a great flight, and uh, it's been wonderful hearing from you and, and everybody. So I continue to want to hear those stories. Thanks. Any last Thank words? You, Much doing... appreciated. Yeah. Any last words from you, Alan? Alan Mandel? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of curious. Uh, uh, you are muted. Hold on. You're not. You're not muted. No, you're, you're not muted. Well, you were. Now, you're telling now. You might. Yeah. You might want to talk about the. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Show. I, I would like to hear is one good story, but uh, what uh, Steve and uh, you, John, have had together, you know, some kind of adventure where, where you two were uh, were hanging out and had a great time. And nobody uh, got arrested. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of times. <laughs> Lots of times, yeah. you know. Well, you talk about the time when uh, when uh, uh, Steve's car broke down and he was at a payphone and had to make, had to make a call to deal with getting his car. 
getting a, his car uh, fixed up and and uh, he thought it would be a good time to try the blue box and he was with ah. uh, Jobs and uh, so uh, uh, Steve do you want to finish the rest of it? You see sure. your story. That night John Draper had come to my dorm room. All the people in the dorm had heard all the stories about phone freaking and what it was about and seeing demos and John Draper's going to come. Captain Crunch is going to come. And there he was at the door and he took us to Kip's Pizza Parlor till maybe 11 p.m. or so that night. And he was telling us all the different codes and how to dial the inward to a country and ask for the inward to a city and then um, and this and that. And uh, and he taught us sort of a technique if you use if you use a blue box in a payphone. Well, that night, Steve Jobs' uh, car broke down. His generator was no good, and it just, the car just stopped. But we could see a payphone, a gas station, around midnight. And we walked to it, and Steve said, let's try a call with the – let's try a blue box call. We could have put money in, and we'll call back to a, a Berkeley phone freak named Groucho, and because he was going to – or to John Draper was going to drive by us that direction and pick us up, take us home. And we tried the phone call. And Steve Jobs hung up the phone real quick and said the operator came on the line. And I said, remember, you have to tell her that it's a data call. The lights will flash. And he said something about it's a data call. And he made try it again. And she, he, she came on the line again. He was all scared. And then a cop car pulls up. Oh. And the cops come up to us. And Steve was shaking, but he got the payphone to me. I had a code on, so I got it in a pocket. And the cops patted us down. And pulled out this blue box, you know, it's got the numbers one, two, three, four, and they make weird sounds. And I said, and the Moog synthesizer was brand new and it was in newspaper articles. So I said, it's an electronic music synthesizer. Oh. Uh, and I, I push a couple of buttons. E you know, you can never make music on it. And the cops looked at it and they said, what's the orange button for? That was 2600 hertz. Steve Ooh. said, that's for calibration. The ah. second cop took the blue box. He asked the same questions, you know, electronic music synthesizer. What's the orange button for? And Steve said something about his computer control. The guy looked over and says, where's the computer plug in? Steve said, oh, that's <laughs> on the inside. I mean, all this BS, we knew, and we knew we were, this cop said, well, what are you out here for? Our car broke down the freeway. Well, why don't we take you there? And we get in the back of the cop car and a cop <laughs> in the passenger seat hands cross, crossways, hands the blue box to me and says, a guy named Moog beat you to it. <laughs> oh my god. What a story. <laughs> that was the story about the Pope. Another one with, with John Draper was when he wrote his he had his Charlie board and he had it, uh, he wanted to crack these watts extenders where you could dial into a company with an 800 yeah, number 800%. and it had a couple of tones, beep, 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 beep. And his board could actually spot the right tones. And then you had to type 86 pound sign or something. And then you got another beep, and then you had to type in a four-digit code, 0000. And if that doesn't work, instantly his, his board could hang up with the program he wrote in BASIC, and then it would try the next number, 0001, 0002. And he was making 5,000 calls a night from his Mountain View apartment, and they shut him off eventually because he was their, their percentage of calls that don't go through had risen from 30 percent that month to 80 percent oh my god and they kind of knew what he was doing he was cracking a lot of these watts extenders too before he went out to philadelphia and got busted again and oh i was god. sitting there one time going to lunch with randy wigginton just joking that oh my gosh we could take his program and instead of having it dial these numbers we could have it dial hawaiian numbers so he has to pay hawaiian phone call cost or something, but we figured out his phone bill would be so thick and 20,000 call, calls and $20,000. And well, we couldn't dare get, that was just too risky. It was too bad. I remember, uh, I remember uh, in, in, in our cubicle at Apple, uh, I just finished the phone board and I left you a note uh, telling you how to use it and stuff like that. And you programmed it to call Steve Jobs' home over and over and over again. <laughs> the next day, Jobs come in just madder than a wet hen. Oh, I don't know what's going on, you know. So, uh, that was a pretty, uh, pretty intense. Your board never made it to a product. Here. Yeah. Hey, tell about the Pope. Thank God. <laughs> I was. Oh, you, I, I want to talk one more thing, and I'll talk about this story real quick. Um, when I was doing the watch extender dialings and stuff like that, um, I, I recorded a lot of eight hundred numbers, and I found this really interesting eight hundred number eight hundred four two four nine three three seven. And uh, it got this really angry person answering the phone, and, and he said, get off this line right away. And, and I kind of raised a few flags. So I did a little social engineering, and I found out that that number, I, I called the number up. I said, this is, uh, this is White Plains toll 4A toll switching uh, uh, center here at White Plains, New York, and we're having some problems uh, with your tenant. 
uh, Trump clients, uh, what number have we reached? And he says, oh, you reached the uh, White House. This is the CIA crisis hotline number. And so uh, I wrote that down, and, and then for a while, <laughs> the crisis number, and then I found out what the, uh, what the uh, auto-verify number was, so we could tap the line for a while. We found out that the, that the person answering the phone was, was Nixon, because his, his key name was Olympus. <laughs> oh. And so, uh, and so uh, when, we, uh, when he answered the phone, we said, Olympus, please. And then one of the other guys yanked the phone away from me, and says, sir, we have a national crisis on our hands, sir. He says, what's the nature of the crisis? He says, sir, we're out of toilet paper. And we hung up. And that was the and White 40 House. 40 years Club. later, that yes. turned out to be the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Another well, one. Just I, remember, I remember John showing me at a, at a public pay phone in Los Altos that after 8 p.m., if you dialed 611 for telephone repair, um, instead of getting a local telephone repair, they were shut down. It redialed. You could hear it clicking, doing the tap dialing. Click, 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 click. And I, the first three digits were 298, I think. It was a number that I recognized as being in San Jose. So it would call the San Jose office to um, to make the 611 call. But John went up to the payphone. He could add his own taps in, his own little taps hooks in, and he could actually dial a number in New York successfully that way. And that was kind of cool. And another time he taught me a code that would tap numbers in the Bay Area. I typed in yeah. the code at call computer. We were down at call computer. I typed in the number of the FBI. I popped up. Well, and I yeah, the, them the code name is 052. About a case uh, in progress and picking a guy up. And, uh, and uh, John said that one time they heard this faint little beep that came on every 10 seconds. Beep, very beep. One time they heard it. And one of them said, oh, it's the guys downstairs taping us. They thought it was the phone guys <laughs> rather than somebody listening in. Yeah, we were actually tapping the FBI's phone number uh, using the uh, blue box and we're using auto verify. You do KP052 uh, and then the 415-552, uh, whatever it is for the, for the FBI. And you click plop and you hear this little, little hot whistle. And you give it a little burst of 2600, it, it chirp off the scrambler and you could hear it. And then, of course, you get the beep tone coming on there. And one time the FBI was talking about some golfing thing, like that all of a sudden the beep come on there. And one of the guys says, looks like they got you tuned in, don't they? <laughs> it was really funny. These are the good memories. So we we right? had to be really yeah. careful about that. So we kind of like, at that point, we hung up. Sorry. Eventually, of course, you know, after about maybe six months or so after I got busted, I had to tell the FBI about how I did all that stuff. And uh, they were so fascinated by that. <laughs> and, and then they had some people at the Pentagon there because I was accessing the Audubon through the military network and showed them how I accessed the Audubon stuff. Because that was part of my plea bargaining. <laughs> so I actually had to show everybody how I did all that stuff without t naming any names, of course. You've got to go. My 1963 first computer has just crashed. <laughs> you have that? Oh, man, I can't even show it. Nice seeing you bye guys. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Take care, Gary. Take care, everybody. So we're gonna we're gonna conclude at this point. Uh, so I will send uh, each one of you send me an email. I'll send you a link to the uh, to the uh, uh, Dropbox or the cloud storage, and you can pull it down and watch it. And then I'm gonna start right. editing it. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank cool. you, John. Thanks, John. Nice meeting nice you all. Together. Take care. Thank you, John. Yeah. Nice yeah. You yeah. It was a great meeting, by the way. I'm really impressed how well it turned out. Thank you yeah, all for uh, attending. This was really great. Yep. All right, y'all. Right. I'm out of here. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Uh -oh. That concludes the Homebrew Computer Club reunion. And I'm really glad you all were tuning in. It's a very long, long video. I had to break it up into three parts. And kind of had to keep you waiting for the next episode. I mean, you know, come on. You got to join my Patreon in order to watch all three. And you go to patreon.com forward slash JD Crunch Time. That's it. And you can get access to a lot of these videos, uh, mostly fairly well edited and, uh, you know, ready to watch. So again, uh, I'll say farewell to you all. And I have some other videos coming up as well. Uh, we'll be interviewing uh, Daniel Kotke. He was one of the like uh, very early employees at Apple Computer. And he has some stories to tell as well. Plus, I have uh, another uh, interview I did with Roy Kaler. Roy was a person 
who during the Yath Crunch built a kit for modifying a Volkswagen Beetle into an electric car. And he's a fascinating individual, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to what he has to say. So with that, I say farewell and see you later. And without these fine Patreons, we have not been able to do such fine editing work. <laughs> <laughs>